Thanks, Jim. Thank you. I mean, where would you rather be on Friday night in March than here with the people of God? Uh, the only to? other option that would be better would be heaven. Yeah, I mean, there you go. A, yeah. Amen. 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 So, Dr. Lutzer, and, and a lot of us know you and know different things about you, but tell us a little bit about your family, and you've been at Moody Church, which is just a historic church, and just tell yes, us a little I've bit about Yes, I've been the pastor there for 36 years. My lovely wife, Rebecca, came with me from Chicago today, but we have a daughter and a son-in-law and three of our grandchildren who live here in Indy in Plainfield. So she decided to go with them because she said she's heard the speaker before. <laughs> Uh, she is a remarkable woman. Oftentimes, I, I shouldn't say this out loud so you don't have to listen, but oftentimes my wife, actually, God leads me through my wife. Uh, in fact, whenever I hear the voice of God, it sounds an awful lot like Rebecca. Amen to that. And we're in the grandkid or grandparenting yeah. age, too, so I... Yeah, yeah. That is just, what a blessed time to yes. be, right? You can give them back to the yeah. parents. Want to see my picture of my... Well, I tell yeah. you what, let me just... We'll just <laughs> <laughs> we could do that. So what do you do for fun in life? Um, uh, what do I do for fun? Well, I, uh, I used to play tennis, but my tennis player died <laughs> through no uh, special fault of my own. Of course... Uh, <laughs> Tennis players make awful husbands and fathers, usually, because to a tennis player, love means nothing, you know. <laughs> but um, now I don't do a lot of exercising. I do do reading. I really do think that that's something I enjoy doing. I don't get to read everything I'd like to, though, for lack of time. Well, if you'd yeah. like, we will give you one free book from our book table. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I was hoping I'd come back with something. There you go. Well, yeah. I can promise you that. So I also, and this was by popular demand, I had a number of people um, just asking if you could possibly do the thing that you do that you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes. Do you want to stay up here for that? I w you want me what, not to? Yeah, like why, to don't, do why don't you just go down the stairs? All right, all right. I will do that. Because uh, you yeah. might have to come forward in the invitation. There so. you go. All right. Well, then let me at least say this, and I'll yeah. let you do that, and then you yeah. can go to speak. And that is that when you agreed to come speak, whatever, a year, year and a half ago, I, Mark and I both, just our hearts were lifted up and said, thank, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to experience the ministry of a guy that's ministered to our lives. So minister to our church, you. our people. God We're thankful you. that you're here. I feel Thanks very welcome. First of all, I do want to bring you greetings from the beautiful city of Chicago, the city of righteousness, love, truth, and justice. <laughs> it was colder here today than I thought it was going to be. It's been a warm winter in Chicago, but last winter was mighty cold. In fact, it was so cold that according to the media, and if it's in the media, you know that it's true. <laughs> it was so cold that uh, I think it was January the 19th. It was so cold that apparently some of our politicians were actually seen with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going too fast for some of you? Well, we're going to have a great time. What he is referring to is when I was a boy growing up on a farm in Canada, and I was a Canadian until 10, 12 years ago, uh, I, I became enamored with a man by the name of Billy Graham. How many of you have heard of Billy Graham? Could I see your hands, please? How many of you have seen him preach, maybe on television, maybe live? Billy stands six foot two in his socks. I said that to a friend of mine. He said, that's interesting. How tall is he without them? Depends a little bit on the socks that you're wearing. One day I was on a plane and a woman said, you have a blue sock and a red sock, your so socks don't match. I said, oh yes they do because I go by thickness. <laughs> now before I give you a little bit of Billy Graham, uh, this is the book that I'm speaking from, Rescuing the Gospel. Some lucky person got a free copy, and uh, 
this is the one that's subsidized. It's, you know, you say, well, should I buy it or should I not? Joe didn't know how to finish the sentence. I'll finish it. Do you want God to bless you or don't you? <laughs> but this is it, rescuing the gospel. With that, tonight, because you're relaxed, I'll give you a couple of lines at least. And this is, of course, a younger Billy. You know that Billy now is about 98 years old, but I suppose he was in Indianapolis sometime for a crusade, speaking in some large uh, sanct auditorium, stadium, whatever it is that you folks have here. And um, I'll just begin, and uh, we'll give you a little Billy right in the middle of a sermon. We'll try. The problems and the perplexities that we face as a nation seem to be almost overwhelming. Recently, one of our leaders speaking to a group of students at Johns Hopkins University said that we may well be living in the most confusing, bewildering, and perplexing hour of history. All of our leaders agree that the world seems to be plunging headlong toward disaster. But this evening, it is our privilege to be in Indianapolis, the gateway to the great Midwest. We have been impressed with its beautiful banks, offices, hospitals, and factories, which form a striking picture against the evening sky. This evening, it is my privilege to be at its, at its leading church. As I've traveled around the world, I've met scores of young people from this church founded so many years ago. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to come, hundreds of you. You simply get up out of your seats, and I want you to come. And for those of you who have joined us tonight by television, we'd like to send you some literature. We'd like to send you a book that has been a blessing to tens of thousands of people <laughs> around the world, written by Pastor Lutza. Just write to me, Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's all the address you need, just Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> now until the same time next week, goodbye, and may the Lord bless you real good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do want to say what a delight it is to be here to meet Joe, to become better acquainted with your pastor, Mark, and all the great things that God is doing. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be speaking to you about Martin Luther. You'll never forget the lecture that I will give, I'm sure, because he is the one that we think about when we think of the 500th anniversary. And then in the, and in the second hour, we're going to talk about John Calvin, and uh, the Swiss reformers, and I'm going to tell you about hundreds of people that were massacred because they believed that one should be baptized upon profession of faith. So don't even think about doing anything else but coming tomorrow. It is God's will that you come here, and we'll have a great time. Tonight I'm going to speak to you about a pre-reformer whose name is John Hus. He lived a hundred years or so before Luther. He was actually born in 1372, and John Hus was born in Bohemia. And thank God for the booklets that were created because it enables you to take notes. And when you take notes, and especially those of you on the front row, I'm looking at the front row because front row on earth is front row in heaven, friends, <laughs> which makes me always keep my eyes on the back row. John Hus, born in Bohemia in 1372, in Czech, his name Hus means goose. In fact, he used to sign his letters, in effect, the goose. The goose was greatly influenced by a man in England by the name of John Wycliffe. And in a moment or two, we'll talk about Wycliffe briefly, and then we'll get to John Hus. But you have to understand the context in which these men lived. Their lives overlapped for a few years during two of the greatest, two or three of the greatest scandals that have ever happened in Christendom. For example, in 1305 to 1377, the first scandal, and if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down, 
The first scandal is known as the Babylonian captivity of the church. Why is it called Babylonian? It's because Babylon, you remember the Jews were in Babylon for 70 years, and for 72 years actually, to be accurate, the papacy was moved from Rome to Avignon, France. And from France, six popes ruled. And of course, the popes in, uh, excuse me, the people of Italy did not accept those popes as being legitimate. And so you have this scandal in Europe with the papacy having moved out of Rome, and uh, you have French popes ruling from France. Now, finally, in 1377, the Italians, the cardinals, got together and they anointed their own pope, and finally they had a pope. But the other two did not resign. So what you had is actually a situation in which uh, there were not only two popes now, but there were three popes, three popes, all ruling, all saying that they were the uh, successors to Peter, all emphasizing the fact that they were at war with the other, raising funds, selling indulgences, and, and the like. So finally, to end this scandal, in 1377, actually, actually 1377 is the time when uh, you have the Council of Pisa, not pizza, but Pisa, and they gathered together and they said, we have to end this scandal, and I misspoke just a moment ago, that's the time when, instead of having two popes rule, they now had three, because they do depose the other two, they anointed another one, and neither of them resigned. So you have three popes ruling, and this is what is known in church history as the papal schism. And the resolution of it I'll tell you about in just a moment, but first of all, it is in this context then that you have a man in England in Oxford by the name of John Wycliffe. He is probably Oxford's greatest scholar, and he is lecturing, and he comes to the conclusion that the church is corrupt. He speaks about simony. Simony was the purchasing of religious office. In other words, if you wanted a bishopric or if you wanted to be exalted in the church, you had to pay money. And of course, later on, as we'll learn tomorrow, it is that scandal when indulgences were sold that eventually become, became the spark that, um, that sparked Luther and what we call the Protestant Reformation. So he spoke against simony. He spoke against the ecclesiastical laws, ecclesiastical laws which protected the priests. You know, in those days, the priests were not judged by standard law. They had their own laws, and a lot of sin was covered. Here in the United States, when some of the priests were going through scandals, perhaps 10 years or so ago, and it was on the news continually, they were then subject to our national law, to our civil laws. But in those days, it was the church that took care of the scandals, and the church covered up a great deal, as you may imagine. In those days also, it's important for you to understand this in Catholic theology, and by the way, if you're here today and you are a Catholic, I want you to know that we are pleased that you are here. We're genuinely glad that you are here. We hope that you come again tomorrow. You are our friends. Chicago is a very Catholic town, and we have a lot of people that have been at Moody Church who were raised Catholic. So we understand you, and thank you so much for joining us on this journey. But in the Catholic theology, the sacraments become the means of salvation. And going back even to Augustine, it was said that the sacraments in themselves have power. The Latin is ex opere operato, in and of themselves. It does not matter what kind of a lifestyle the priest is living. He could be an adulterer, he could be a thief, it did not matter. In the process of transforming, for example, wine into the blood of Christ or bread into the body of Christ or instituting other of the sacraments, in the process, those sacraments in and of themselves have power. And so what happened is by detecting or dislodging, I should say, 
the connection between the sacraments and the lifestyle of the priest, it did not really matter how corrupt the priests were. As a matter of fact, as you know, during the time when the Catholic Church in our era, 10 years ago or so, when the scandals were on the news, no one questioned whether or not the sacraments were valid. Because long ago, the church said the lifestyle of the priest does not affect the sacraments. Well, the problem is this allowed all kinds of abuses and all kinds of sins to continue. So that's what was happening in those days. So here's Wycliffe in England, teacher at Oxford, and he's the one, and you've heard of Wycliffe Bible translators, named, of course, after him. He's the one who uh, had people copy the Bible. He had his students do that. Now, think this through. This is before Gutenberg. Luther is going to live after Gutenberg and the invention of the printing press. So the only way in which Wycliffe could have Bibles multiplied is for students to copy them. And it would take maybe a month or so for a student to actually copy all of the Scriptures. And then the church, whenever they found these copies of the Scriptures, would have them burned. Years ago, I was in England and attended church in St. Paul's Cathedral. If you ever go to St. Paul's Cathedral, go to where the statue of St. Paul is, out in the courtyard area, and there you will see where the original St. Paul statue was, and it is there that many of the Bibles were taken and they were burned. But one of the things that Wycliffe did is he also taught his pupils how to die for the faith because many of them were martyred. Many of them were put to death, but Wycliffe continued doing what he was doing, and God was with him. He taught that the church was invisible, that the true people of God were in invisible company. They were not necessarily coextensive with everybody who goes to church or everybody who calls himself Christian. He also believed that the cup should be given to the laity. Because in those days, when the priest would take the wine and believe that he was translating it into the blood of Christ, the cup was not given to the laity because they might spill it, uh, they might desecrate it, perhaps they would spill the blood of Christ on the floor, and so um, the cup was not given to the laity. And uh, Wycliffe came along and said that the Bible alone is our source of authority, and therefore we are all priests before God, and Luther is going to emphasize that point as well. And therefore, everyone should partake of the bread. Everyone should partake of the wine because we are priests before God. He opposed transubstantiation. He did not believe that the wine and the bread were literally translated into the body and the blood of Christ. And so because he um, was there, in Oxford preaching and teaching these things. Students came from Prague to go to university in Oxford. And there was a reason for that. There was a marriage that brought that about. And that's how John Huss in Prague now comes across the teaching of the gospel and uh, begins to read the writings of Wycliffe and is greatly influenced and believes the gospel and begins essentially to preach the same things in the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. So here's John Huss. He's preaching to large crowds. He's emphasizing the Bible alone as a source of authority. When it comes to the Reformation, this is sola scriptura. Sola meaning alone, the Bible alone, the scriptures alone as the source of authority, not tradition. And uh, he's teaching the priesthood of the believer if you've ever been to Prague, there is a huge monument to John Huss in downtown Prague. And among other things, what the monument shows is that Huss is giving the cup again to the laity. And he is recognizing that all of us are priests before God, and therefore he was standing against the church and its traditions. Because historically in medieval times, if you wanted to have a prayer given to God, you went to the priest and asked him to pray it. You asked the priest to intercede for you. Now, said John Huss and Wycliffe, 
and later on Luther, we can all come to God through faith because we are all priests. The implications of that are absolutely huge. So Hus is preaching, and there is a pope ruling by the name of Pope John the XXIII. He's going to become known as an anti-pope. If you look him up in history, and there's a reason for that. But uh, the pope began to sell indulgences in order to finance a war against the king of Naples, and even said, if you come and fight in this war, the church will give you full remission of sins. And of course, Hus was very angry about that and preached against it. Meanwhile, in Rome, the pope hears that Hus is uh, fomenting a revolution against the church and preaching these other doctrines. And so what he does to punish the pope, to punish um, Wycliffe rather, I should say to punish Hus and the people of Prague, he gives what is known in theology as an interdict. An interdict says this, there will be no sacraments administered in the entire city of Prague. Now, you have to understand, put yourself in the people's shoes. You're taught to believe that salvation comes through the sacraments, and now there are no sacraments in Prague. There is no last rites. There is no mass that is to be offered. As far as you're concerned, you're on your way to hell. And so the people of Prague rose up against Hus, and they had such opposition, he had such opposition that he left um, Prague and went to a castle where he wrote two books. One is entitled The Church, The Nature of the Church, and the other is a book against simony, the purchasing of religious privileges by money. All right, now, I've given you that background so that we can put Huss's life in perspective. Here it is. I told you about the Council of Pizza, Pisa. They meet together. And they say, we have to take care of this scandal because we have two popes ruling. They anoint a third, of course, and the third will not resign. And so you have three popes ruling, and the Council of Pisa was supposed to solve that problem, but didn't. All that they did is anoint a new pope, and the other two did not resign. So now you come to the Council of Constance five years later. The Council of Constance was 1414 to uh, 1418. There's a new emperor by the name of Sigismund. Sigismund is the new emperor, and he is a brother to King Wenceslas, who is ruling in Prague. Good King Wenceslas went out on the Feast of Stephen. Actually, when we sing that song at Christmas, if we ever do, we used to when I was growing up, I don't think I've heard it for many, many years, but when we sing it, it is not really to this Wenceslas, it's a previous one to which the song refers. But here's Wenceslas, he's the brother of Sigismund, and he is ruling there in Prague, and the Council of Constance is called to resolve the fact that there are three popes and they do resolve that. What they do is they depose all three. John the Twenty-Third refused to accept it. He still tried to usurp power. He left the council. They arrested him. That's why I said he was known as an anti-pope. But they resolve it, and they put a man... This is very interesting. The first thing that the council does is to vote on the fact that they have authority over the papacy. And uh, they voted that, and they agreed, we have authority over the papacy, and so they deposed the three popes, and they elect one by the name of Martin V. And the first thing Martin V does is issue a decree saying that he is above the council. He was glad, <laughs> he was glad when they said that uh, they were above the papacy and anointed him, but now that he's anointed, he is above them. So that scandal is over. Finally, the church has only one pope, but there is the matter of heresy that needed to be dealt with. You have this swelling tide in Prague, and even though the interdict took place, and then the pope lifted it once Hus stopped his preaching, the fact is that the people there 
were seeking something better than the church was able to offer them. And they remembered the preaching of Hus, and they began to read the Bible, and they began to study the writings of Wycliffe. And so the, the idea was that this young man, Sigismund, who was in effect the new emperor, he needs to take care of John Hus. So he gives John Hus safe conduct. Safe conduct meant that Huss would be able to go from his home there in uh, Prague all the way to Germany, to Constance, and uh, he'd be able to be there. And the emperor says, even if you are found to be a heretic, we'll allow you to go back home safely. King Wenceslas, who was Huss's friend, encouraged Huss to go and said, you should go and defend yourself against charges of heresy. As Huss went from Prague all the way to Constance, Germany, along the way people heard of it and they came out from the villages and so forth and they commended him because they too were tired of the heavy hand of the church, the taxes that had to be paid and what have you, and they saw in Huss a means of deliverance from all that. When Huss um, goes to the council, there is a trial. He is told that there are 42 statements that he makes in his uh, book on the church 42 statements that are incorrect and contrary to church theology. And uh, they try to break his spirit. They put him into a castle. They gave him only scant bread and water. And they did that in order to try to get him to recant. But you know, Huss refused to recant. He said, I would not for a chapel full of gold recede from the truth. I know that the truth stands and is mighty forever and abides eternally with whom there is no respecter of persons. He wrote letters back to his friend and says, O most holy Christ, draw me weak as I am after thyself, for if thou dost not draw us, we cannot follow thee. Strengthen my spirit that it may be willing. If the flesh is weak, let thy grace precede us. Come between and follow, for without thee we cannot go for thy sake. Without thee we cannot go for thy sake to a cruel death. Give me a fearless heart, a right faith, a firm hope, a perfect love, that for their, thy sake I may lay down my life with patience and joy. And so it is that uh, he was brought to trial. He was not really given an opportunity to defend himself. But I want to emphasize the way in which he died, because this is important for us, especially as we think of martyrdom. What happened is he was taken into this room. A crown was put on his head with three demons that were painted on his crown. And the authorities said, we commit your soul to the devil. We put you into the hands of the devil. Huss said, I commit myself into the hands of God. On the way to the execution, by the way, as you've probably already guessed, Sigismund decided that he didn't have to keep his promise to a heretic. So he broke his promise of safe conduct, and now Huss is on his way to an execution, to a burning. Uh, Rebecca and I were in Constance a number of years ago, and we supposedly saw the stone on which Huss, Huss was burned. I'm not sure if it is the correct stone, but you did get the idea. On the way to the execution, Huss saw a bonfire of his books. He laughed and told the bystanders not to believe the lies that were told about him. When he arrived to the place where he would be put to death, he knelt and prayed. For the last time he was asked if he would recant, he said, God is my witness that the evidence against me is false. I have never thought or preached except with one intention of winning men, if possible, from their sins. In the truth of the gospel I have written, taught, and preached, today I will gladly die. They disrobed him, they put a chain around him, and he said, you know, the chain that was around Jesus is heavier than the one that's around me. Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy upon me, he prayed, and upon them. Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy. He began to recite psalms, and soon the wind blew the flames, and John Hus was dead. Now, 
Here's what's interesting. If you notice the title of today's message, it is the, the goose that became a swan. Before Huss died, according to one witness, he said these interesting words. Remember I told you that the word goose and the word huss is the same word in the Czech language. He said, you can cook this goose, but in a hundred years a swan will arise, and him you will not silence. Now, isn't that interesting? One hundred and two years later, Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses to the castle church door that I will tell you about tomorrow morning in Wittenberg, Germany, and he believed that he was the fulfillment of Huss's prophecy. That in a hundred years, and when you see pictures of Luther in Europe, when you go to Wittenberg and elsewhere, oftentimes there's a swan in the picture, which kind of became a symbol of the Reformation. And even today, we still talk about the fact that you can cook his goose, or we say they cooked his goose. And so this goes back now 600 years, actually, to the time of John Huss, who was cooked, but his ideas did not die. They killed Huss, but not his ideas. What happened after that is he, of course, was a martyr as far as the Bohemians were concerned, and the impact of the Reformation was somewhat stifled, needless to say, but the impact of Huss affected next generations. For example, there were some who wanted only minor reforms, and so they didn't see the full impact of what Huss was preaching. But he also inspired people who were known in history as the Moravians. Many years ago, Rebecca and I, when we were in Europe, we rented a car in Berlin and we drove to Moravia. We drove to Herrenhut, Germany, because I wanted to see where the Moravians lived. The Moravians lived there in a colony, about 600 of them, and they lived together. They walked a mile to church together to a place in Germany called Bertelsdorf. By the way, Germany, German is the only language in which you can say I love you, and it sounds like a threat. Um, <laughs> ich liebe dich. Really? Do you want to settle that out in the hall? Maybe we should take care of it out there. And it is there that uh, because of them that Wesley was converted eventually, the Moravians. I want to tell you one story about the Moravians. Why is it that Rebecca and I had an interest in going to see Herrenhut? It's because the Moravians were into music. I mean, they would sing five or six hours at a time. Sometimes they would sing all day. They sent 265 missionaries to different places of the world 65 years before William Carey, whom we generally call the father of modern missions. Very interesting. But there's another reason, music lovers. The Moravians were so into music that the choir that you sang in determined where you would be buried in the cemetery. For example, you know, you sang bass in this choir, hey, all the basses get buried over here. You sing alto, all the altos get buried over here. And I mean, I mean, isn't that a great idea on the day of resurrection? Hey, you know, you're just all ready to go. <laughs> Somebody asked George Beverly Shea, what would you like to be doing when Jesus returned? And he said, I'd like to be on pitch. Well, <laughs> here you have... Here you have the Moravians all ready to go. So we wanted to go see the cemetery. And I can tell you this story too. I, I was trying to figure out where the cemetery was, and I stopped and I asked this man who had just parked his car, and a friend of his went into a museum to get a big key. And I said in my German, I don't know German too well, but I said, you know, can you show us where the cemetery is? And he said, follow me. Oh, okay. So we follow him. And uh, we uh, discovered that a couple of hundred yards away is the cemetery, and they showed it to us. And then he said, follow me. And we went behind the trees, and behind the trees there was a tower that the Moravians built. And this tower was maybe 40 feet high, and it had stairs inside so that you could go onto a balcony that was 360 degrees, cylindrical. And the reason for that balcony is that it symbolized the fact that God is watching over his people. They are buried here in the cemetery. Herrenhut means God's watch. And, and God, is, God is looking over the dead because they are going to be raised. 
One of the men who drove the car, I began to witness to him in German. I, I quoted every verse I knew, which is three or four. I told him he had to be born again. And you know what he told me in German? He says, well, I've been born once. Why should I be born twice? I remembered that there is a story like that, actually, in the Bible. And I told him, I said, it's a stroke of providence that we met. God led me into your life so that you would accept Christ as Savior and repent of your sins and so forth. And he even said, yes, it was providential that you came over just at a time when my friend was getting the key because I was going to show him this tower. And so I urged him to believe the gospel. He didn't write then, but I wonder whether or not he's going to show up in heaven. But the point is, that was in the area of John Huss's influence, and so you saw this going on, the Moravians. Now, with regard to Luther, Luther was involved in a number of different debates. After he published his 95 Theses, he became famous, and there were debates that were taking place, and one of them was in a place called Leipzig, Germany. And Luther was there in Leipzig, and he was being accused by Eck, the Catholic theologian. He was being accused of being a Hussite. And Luther said, no, I'm not a Hussite. And then someone brought him one of Huss's books, and Luther read it, and later said, I am a Hussite even though he knew that Huss had been put to death. We'll talk about this tomorrow, Luther's own courage in the face of death. He indicated that he himself was a Hussite. He was a follower of Huss. I mention that because sometimes we think that the Reformation began when Luther famously nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door that we will talk about tomorrow. But actually, Luther was standing on the shoulders of others who had preceded him. Men like Wycliffe, men like Huss, and one other word about John Wycliffe. Not only did the Council of Constance kill John Huss, that wasn't enough. They actually went and had a delegation go to England, and they dug up the bones of John Wycliffe, who had already died, and they threw them into the river, because they believed that as long as his bones were in the river, he could not be resurrected, or at least they hoped that he wouldn't be and so the bones of John Wycliffe were dug up. But somebody said this, you know, the bones were thrown into the Swift River. The Swift River flows into the Avignon. The Avignon eventually flows into the ocean. And the influence of the Bible and John Wycliffe goes on even to this day. It's like a pebble that is thrown into a lake. And so you see the ripples go all the way to the shore. Now, what I'd like to do is to give you three takeaways tonight, and thank you for writing these down, three takeaways as to why these events should be transforming for us, and particularly the story of John Huss. Number one, would you remember that there are some things that are worth dying for? There are some things that are worth dying for. I wonder if we as Americans are ready for that. You know, we complain a lot if we find out our rights are being violated and our freedoms are being taken away from us, as is happening oftentimes in society. We have to remember the fact that we should be willing to be loving, caring people, but at the same time with bedrock convictions and say, as we'll see Luther say, Here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anderes. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. And could we instill in our young people and in our children that kind of courage? And one of the ways in which we can do it is to teach them biography, teach them history. Find out the greats of the past, get some biographies, read their stories, and that they might know that persecution has been the usual experience of the church. What we've experienced here in America is actually an anomaly. Most of the time, throughout 2,000 years of history, the church has been marginalized, spoken against, persecuted, 
thrown into huge convulsions because of enemies within and enemies without, and you and I need to know that history so that we are not surprised at the fiery trial that is to try us, as Peter says, but to rejoice inasmuch as we are partakers of Christ's suffering. We as Americans need to learn to rejoice rather than try to spend a lot of time opposing and complaining about our situation in life. There are some things that are worth dying for, and Huss proved that. Second, theologically important. Even when we are in the hands of the devil, write this down, you may be going through a terrible, terrible experience in court. Some of us know what that is about if we are sued and wrongly sued. You may be going through a huge amount of injustice, and all that you can see is the devil. Tonight I want you to see beyond that, and I want you to see beyond that to God. Listen to what Jesus Christ said to the church in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, and I'm picking it up at verse 10. Listen very carefully. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days. You'll have tribulation. By the way, when Jesus said that they are going to have tribulation 10 days, all the forces of hell cannot make it 11. Is it legal for you folks to say amen here? Or <laughs> I was just wondering. I thought maybe, maybe the ACLU got to you or something. <laughs> Do not fear what you're about to suffer. You'll be tested 10 days. You'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Now listen, you're going to be thrown into the devil's hands. You're going to be thrown into prison for 10 days. We don't know whether the 10 days is 10 literal days or 10 years or 10 whatever, but whatever it is, Jesus is going to keep his hand on the thermostat, okay? You're going to be thrown into the fire, but I'll keep my hand on the thermostat. And now notice that if you're faithful unto death, you'll receive the crown of life. You're thrown into the hands of the devil, but as a believer, you are still in the hands of God. Best illustration of this. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, Jesus was crucified by wicked men. Wicked hands crucified Jesus. You remember that? In the book of Acts, wicked hands crucified Jesus, but when Jesus dies on the cross, what are his last words? His last words are, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And you and I must see beyond the persecution, we must see beyond the attacks of the devil, and we must remember that beyond all that we see God. Even when we are in the devil's hands, we're still in the hands of God. They said to John Huss, we give you into the hands of the devil. Huss said, I give myself into the hands of God. There's a third lesson, and that is that dying grace is given when we need it. Dying grace is given when we need it. You know that uh, I marvel at Huss. I marvel at a lot of people. I marvel at Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Of course, Stephen looks up into heaven and he actually sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. At least 10 times in the New Testament, the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and he's seated because his work is done. In the Old Testament, the priests were never allowed to sit if you were on an eight-hour shift, you stood the whole eight hours. But Jesus Christ's work is done, and he sits on the right hand of God. And here, Stephen is being stoned, and Jesus is standing. It's as if Jesus is saying, uh, keep it up, Stephen. I know that the stones hurt, but I'm going to be here for you. And I can't help but think that when martyrs die, when 
John Hus died in Constance so many years ago, and contemporary martyrs. As you know, thousands of Christians are being martyred every single year, particularly in the Middle East, that Jesus is standing there welcoming them. Where do they get the courage to pay, pray for their enemies? Lord, lay not this sin for their charge. They get it because God gives you dying grace. Corrie Ten Boom, many of you will remember her and uh, the testimony that she gave having come through the Holocaust, having lost her sister and so forth. She said that when she was a little girl and she was so afraid of death, her father said to her, Corey, when you and I take the train to Amsterdam, uh, when do I give you the ticket to get on the train? And she says, well, Daddy, you give me the ticket just as I am ready to get on the train. That's right. You don't need the ticket until you're ready to step on the train. In the very same way, her father said, you may be fearful of death now, but when you know Christ as Savior, what happens is God gives you dying grace when it's time to die. Now, my parents had that dying grace. My father, by the way, uh, lived to 106, my mother to 103. In fact, my, my parents lived so long that I'm sure until my father died, all of their friends in heaven thought that they just didn't make it. You know, they said, <laughs> where are the Lutzers? <laughs> but I can assure you that the Lutzers made it. My mother was so excited about seeing Jesus, the most disappointing thing that happened to her day after day after day is that she woke up alive. And she said to my sister, when I die, I don't want you to cry. I want, I'll finish the story. She said, I don't want you to cry. I want you to shout hallelujah. You know what happened? My mother loved Jesus. Oh, incredible. The night she died... A worker came from the second floor of the home in which she was living, the uh, home for uh, folks who were aged, and, and my sister had only seen this woman once, didn't know who she was, and she's in the room, and uh, my mother dies, and my sister's dissolving into tears, and here's a woman to whom my sister had never spoken once in the room from another floor. And she lifts her hands and says, Thank God, hallelujah, Wanda Lutzer is in heaven. You know what? It's as if God says, I'm going to give Wanda her last request, and if her daughter cannot shout hallelujah, <laughs> I'll send somebody into the room who will. God gave grace to John Huss. You're going to learn tomorrow things that you didn't know before. People drowned and killed with a sword. God gives us grace to die when we need it. Can I pray for you? And then after that, Joe is going to come up with a few remarks. Father, thank you for these dear people. Thank you that they were willing to come out on a Friday night. Thank you, Father, for the memory of Wycliffe and Huss who uh, went before us and were willing to die for the faith and willing to stand for the faith, and they model for us how to die. Lord Jesus, we pray, may we be inspired to live for you, and when the time comes, to die for you as well. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good evening.